I've been doing a mini-series called Atheism versus India Revisited, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to do videos on this subject, not because I've run out of steam, but because things are getting so esoteric that I often seriously doubt my ability to get the idea across that I'm trying to convey. And when that thought, that sort of hesitancy starts, it creates kind of a, a, um, a sense of urgency, I guess, to try and try harder to get your idea across. You sort of say, okay, I know that this sounds weird, and that's one thing that I'm quite certain of, and I've said from the beginning that Tantra seems crazy um, when you look at it at first from the outside. When you see things like artwork depicting the subtle body, or when you start discussing things like chakras or the kundalini, or when you start um, dealing with reality as an experiential phenomenon as opposed to an observed phenomenon. In other words, you're looking at reality from your own exclusive experiential point of view. It's no longer, you're no longer dealing in verifiables here. Um, I think that again we, ha we have kind of Western logic or at least the Western scientific method to blame for this because um, it's all about that which is verifiable and everybody seems to have bought into this way of looking at the world and, and I shouldn't even say bought into it, I should say they have taken that view of the world is the only possible view of the world. When you argue, say, with a, an evangelical Bible Protestant, something like that kind of a person, they will discuss things like why creation is correct, why the world worked out in a certain way, and they will go at observable um, things like fossils and all that kind of thing, verifiable, falsifiable, etc. They've bought into this. I, I shouldn't say bought into it, but they bought into the idea that that's the only way to look at reality. Looking at reality from the first person perspective is what Tantra is about. Um, it's dealing in non verifiables. If you deal in non verifiables, you have to use metaphors, you have to use diagrams, you have to be elliptical when you discuss things. You have to be somewhat cryptic, poetic even, artistic. You have to hint at things. Um, <clears throat> because it's not so clear. Um, our tools aren't really equipped to deal with things like that. Our language, our methods of communication, uh, all of our sciences. Uh, psychology, I guess, might be an exception. But psychology tends to be, if you ask me, a sort of a pathological thing. In other words, dealing with what's wrong with your psychology as opposed to um, how you can use your own psychology to actually benefit yourself, to enhance your life, uh, enhance your quality of existence. Um, so many people sort of think, ah, you're talking about doing drugs or being you know, blatantly hedonistic or whatever. Maybe. It, it looks like that, again, from the outside. There is a sexual element in Tantra, and there's, uh, at least in terms of the Western kind of cheap version of Tantra, there's drugs there, too. Uh, you know, there's no denying that. Um, but are there other ways to manipulate your psychology and your own physical experience of reality to actually create positives? positive experiences that will have a positive effect on you. Um, some people are going to argue with the way that I just phrased that. Um, in other words, you don't expect anything, you don't want anything, you don't, um, you're not trying to change anything, you want to experience something. But the thing is, experience changes you. That's karma. Whatever you experience leaves its mark. Um, so if you're going to manipulate your experiences, you're manipulating yourself. You are altering what you are.
fundamentally from the inside. You're not changing your image. Your image is what everybody else sees. You're not changing your health or you're not changing other things that you can sort of compare yourself to other people with. Um, you, you can never really tell if somebody, if you ask me, if somebody has been successful in Tantra. You can look at somebody who's gotten really good at Hatha Yoga, for example, and do, can do all the completely bizarre poses in Hatha Yoga, yes. But if you ask me, it's really, it's all up here, and that is not verifiable. We can watch people's brain patterns from the outside, we can listen to how they try to describe their experiences, but with one's own experiences, one is forever alone. And that's where it becomes weird. Um, and I, I just can't help thinking that any more efforts that I put into this to attempt to explain it will come across as proselytism. And nothing is more repugnant to me than that. A proselytism of any kind, trying to spread any idea. Um, I see proselytism now taking place in atheism. Um, don't like that at all. It's just as bad as when the Jehovah's come and knock on your door and say, this is what you should believe because your present beliefs are wrong. Stupid. And I do not want to go down that road. That's why I won't say that this series is petering out, but it may be sort of grinding to a halt because I've lost confidence in my ability to put the ideas across. And that's okay, though, because, again, Tantra says this will happen. <laughs> You'll, you'll reach that point where you're kind of, uh, I can't talk about it anymore because it's, we're, I've gone off that map. Um, I turned 50 a month ago, and um, or just actually a couple of weeks ago, and my wife bought me this. Um, it's a book by Ajit Mukherjee. It's a good introduction to the idea of Tantra. But I think that if you don't, uh, if you don't understand the or if you don't sort of get the original esoteric expectation from the very beginning, I think that the whole subject is kind of a waste of time for somebody. Um, and I and I can't... I, I'm grappling with that feeling right now. This is a disjointed video, and I'm sort of trying to explain exactly why I'm finding it increasingly difficult to talk about this subject. Um, I'll try to do another video on my experiences with Hatha Yoga. In other words... Um, understanding um, what it means to inhabit a human body from the inside. What is the experience of being encased in flesh from the inside, and what can we do about it? Um, in other words, put the psyche completely in the driver's seat and only deal with that which the psyche experiences, if you want to look at it that way, in terms of the physical body. Um, checking out how to manipulate a particular muscle, checking out um, where positive and negative force interact in your own body. I'm not talking about positive and negative energy, but that's a lot of tantric language talks that way. I'll use the more scientific uh, idea of force. In other words, what, what direction do, do forces move in your muscle? And when you um, apply force to one muscle, how does it impact the muscle next to it? set off a chain reaction. What's going on inside of your body? Every muscle is attached to every other muscle, at least by way of other muscles or ligaments or whatever. You can't affect one without affecting them all. What does this cumulative effect have? Can you do that to your own nervous system? Um, can you manipulate your own brain activity to bring on a powerful positive state? That, I believe, is possible. Uh, I believe that I have done it, and I have no way of proving any of it to anybody. Um, but uh, that's for, uh, I guess, the final video. Um, things start to look weird when you get into Tantra. Oh, um, this book, um, Ajit Mukherjee, The Tantric Way. Uh, an interesting very beginning to um, the whole Tantric thing. Um, I'm a very visual person. I... I subscribe to the idea that a picture is worth a thousand words, and I don't think anything is wrong with having a book full of pictures. Something unwestern about that, isn't there? Um, but um, it's uh, it's a fascinating field, and it brings me back to the old discussion about 
life affirmation versus life denial. Um, life denial often says it's almost impossible to point to something positive. Just because you can't point to something positive in this plane of existence doesn't mean that it's not there. <laughs> uh, it just means that you can't point to it. You can't describe it to somebody else. But it is there. Um, can't prove it, but again, just because I can't prove something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Western scientific thinking seems to say if I can't prove it or falsify it, it doesn't exist. I know it doesn't really say that, but in a lot of people's usage of science, that kind of thinking has crept in. Tantra seeks to go beyond that. It seeks to say, it seeks to sort of admit that that which is an enhancement or a plus or a good or an improvement or a better place in life is something that must be experienced. <laughs> um, you can't um, you can't put it into words, the positives in life. You can't put it into words, the positives that are experiential. You can't put these things into words. You have to rely on art and ritual in many ways. Uh, you know, what is art after all? Art, if, if you ask me, is an attempt to manipulate our experiences. All art, in a certain sense, in my opinion, is tantric art. Because it's, art is meant to act on this. It's meant to provoke a reaction. There is the phenomenon of art criticism, but that's not art, is it? It's sort of an offshoot of art. Art, if you ask me, is the direct experience of staring at a work of art or experiencing that work of art. That's Tantra. Music is almost by its very nature Tantric. Um, <clears throat> music and anything that is considered in the arts is what I would put under the heading of Tantra. Um, when you're discussing things like value, um, when you're discussing things like what is the value of existence, or you're discussing things, what is the value, what are the major values that we deal with in terms of human existence, um, we tend to agree on the negatives, and the negatives seem to be falsifiable. Um, they seem to be tangible. They seem to be the sort of thing that you can actually talk about and you can actually explore the negatives. Because we know what a horrible monster looks like. We know that it scares us. We know what a hitting your thumb with a hammer feels like. It's, you know, generally assumed to be bad. What's good? <laughs> um, it's an interesting question, isn't it? We know what negative is. It's obvious. Um, it's so obvious that some people then say negative is all that exists. Because the positive is not falsifiable. <laughs> um, it's not a positive in the same way as a negative is obviously a negative. If you ride the tiger of Tantra, if you decide that you're going to exist in the here and now in every second of your life, in other words, you're going to sort of live in the moment at all times, a very Tantric idea, um, how do you describe the positives that you experience, the positive that is great mental clarity coupled with a generally elevated mood. That is a positive. <laughs> that is a positive that blasts any negative, if you ask me, out of the water. Um, a general sense of well-being with extreme mental and psychological and emotional clarity and calmness. Um, that is a positive. But, when you talk about it like that, you know, someone will probe you. What do you mean by that? What do you, what do you mean by, so, your mind's calm, so what? Who cares? You can do that to all of these things if the person is rash enough to think that they can actually talk about their inner life. You can't talk about your inner life in the same way as you can talk of your outer life. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. What does it mean to manipulate your human, your body from the inside? How do you discuss that? How do you discuss the way that muscles work? 
from the inside, not from the outside, not observable things, but the experiential. Again, that's Tantra. And it's esoteric, and it's esoteric to the max. <laughs> um, it's guaranteed to be ridiculed and laughed at. And it's very easy to ridicule it and laugh at it, if you're so inclined. But all that that means, if you ask me, is that people should be wary of discussing these things in public or discussing it with other people who may not be interested. And the only way that you can break through that sort of, um, that sort of barrier that you might have when discussing it with other people is to do something that sounds suspiciously like proselytizing. I can't bring myself to do that. Um, I would rather give up on discussing the whole subject than try to think, okay, I'm spinning my wheels here. How else can I get this idea across? No, I'm not doing that. Um, the road goes off all known maps eventually. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening. It's just that's the bias that's built into our scientific way of thinking. If I can't falsify it, if I can't discuss it, if I can't uh, dispute it, then it's not happening. Again, I don't think that this that science is actually saying this, but a lot of people's usage of science would seem to imply that. I'll see what I can do about making the next video less of a disjointed ramble than this one. <laughs>